because you want to hear bacon and eggs on your outdoor griddle, not the scraping of rust. Introducing the Weber Slate Rust Resistant Griddle. Stays ready, not rusty, with a carbon steel cooktop pre-seasoned and ready to cook on right out of the box. The Weber Slate heats evenly edge to edge up to 500 degrees. All you'll hear is the gasp of amazement from friends and family when you serve the food. Cooking with the Weber Slate Rust Resistant Griddle just sounds delicious and tastes even better. Cocoa Beach, Orlando's closest beach, welcomes you with cool vibes and tasty waves. The surfing capital of the East Coast, Cocoa Beach is your authentic Florida beach town with a laid-back charm. Drop into an ocean of fun with the tastiest waves on the East Coast and chill in the coolest spots under the sun. Cocoa Beach, it's legendary. Plan your trip now at LegendaryCocoBeach.com. Cocoa Beach on Florida's Space Coast. It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Welcome to Tuesday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. So glad you could be with us for the next hour. I'm Paul Dottino. He is two-time Super Bowl champion Jonathan Casillas. And we're here to talk New York Giants football. 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513. Get on the lines. We got them all open right now at the beginning of the program. I want to hear some first-time folks. I know that we lifted the ban, right, in terms of repeat callers during the course of the week for the time being. <laughs> but if we can get some first-time callers in here today, I think it would be fun. It is a glorious day in North Jersey. It's I think beautiful. it's going to be in the 80s, right, Jonathan? It's beautiful right now. Bro. As sunny and as bright and clear skies. Man, what a great day for football. And this was off-season team activity number two for the New York football Giants. Just got done with practice a short time ago. Have a few thoughts, some generic thoughts. Of course, you know, we can't get into specifics. That just is not according to the rules. We just can't do it. But I do have some some generic thoughts after watching the first two OTAs from, from this team. And, Jonathan, what I really want to do is maybe run them by you. And if you have any takes or any questions or any curiosities off some of these things, I want to hear what you have to say. Okay. Number one. Drew Locke has much more athleticism, mobility, and maneuverability than I think anybody thought. Mm. If you don't get to see this guy, now we all knew coming out of school, by the way, I mean, he was a second round draft pick. So he was legit. Yeah. He throws an absolutely gorgeous ball, which we also knew mm -hmm. when he came out in the draft. But what I've seen over the course of the last couple of days, and I certainly saw a lot more of it today is his athleticism and maneuverability and escapability. Uh, I'll be honest with you folks, not having the chance to watch really much of his NFL career, if at all, because let's face it, he's only been a starter for basically one year. Yeah, I'm pleasantly surprised, and I think that's a real plus for the Giants if he can utilize that aspect of his game, if called upon, if Daniel Jones is unable to go or miss his time. Yeah, well, look, uh, I think there's no secret out there, you know, uh, not to say that the pocket quarterback is dead, but I think, I think it's kind of, I mean, I think it's <laughs> it's kind of a, a kind of a dying breed in the NFL. I think the ability to create outside the pocket is huge. Uh, the ability to create, uh, extend uh, passing plays and extend drives with your athleticism, I think that's kind of you know, what everybody's kind of been, you know, floating over to in this last decade of what we've seen football, the NFL really evolved to. So I like it. You know, I, I met him this past weekend. I was at the little softball game, right. the celebrity softball game. I met him there. You know, great, great guys, great energy, you know, in, you know, was with the fans. Good guy to talk to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, for me, you know, I, I always like to see what type of person mm -hmm. the player is. You know, and just getting to meet some of these guys this weekend, Drew Locke being one of them. You know, I got a good feeling about him, and, and I'm happy that he's here. I'm happy that the Giants got a good guy who has durability, you know, which I think was a, a major concern sure. for the quarterback position for the New York Giants. So I think that checks a box. Let's see if 
if he does get the nod early or if he does play at any time this year, you know, if he can back up what he's been showing. He threw one off-angle touchdown pass this morning, too, that I'll be honest with you. I was like, whoa. Pretty good? I, I, I had to do a double take. Pretty good? It, I mean, it was uh, – I don't know. Pierce, it was, it was like two-thirds. It was about a two-thirds angle. It wasn't quite sidearm, but it yeah. was about a two-thirds angle and whipped it to the end zone for, for a score. And I was like – Oh, well, that's a little interesting. Yeah, see, <laughs> I didn't at, expect at, that. at this time of the year, it's really hard to kind of see like, oh, this guy shows us something that would translate over to fully pads with a pass rush in right. front of you. I want to make it clear, but, folks. But yeah. that what you just said, the kind of different arm angle that he showed you, that yeah. can be shown now, and you'd be like, oh, okay, that's a tool that he has in his bag right. that he could use come September. I mean, it may not <clears throat> translate, translate perfectly, but when you do see certain things out here and you're like, okay, at least we know he has that. Right, he has Even that. Even if he can't yep. use it effectively that in a game, in which we bag. don't know, yeah. but at least he's got it. That's good. Yeah. I was, yeah, it, it caused me to double take. Yeah. So that, that was, so anyway, Drew Locke is throwing the ball extremely well. Again, I expected that because he always threw the ball well, even coming out of school. All right, and, so that's and, Drew And Locke. Daniel Jones is out there, right? Or he's doing some stuff, not right. team stuff, right? Or is he doing team stuff? He's doing some stuff, and that's as far as I'm going to go. Okay, cool. We can't yep. fully disclose everything. Understood. You know? yep. Okay. Uh, I know they're going to ask, so I'll make sure I ask first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very impressed with, uh, with uh, Tay Banks. Of course. Um, in, the, uh, in the team uh, snaps earlier today, he, as sharp as a, as a tack. Yeah. yeah. You know? and, and, and he was the guy that got me out in dodgeball twice. Thanks. <laughs> The, okay. the, the, the first game we play. So, first of all, it, this is alumni versus current players, right? right? And all alumni, we're all, like, hesitant because we're like, uh, like, did you get your right? Did you put Ben Gay on? You know, did you put your icy <laughs> out on? You know, you take your you, whatever you need to take to go out here and play against these young boys. Uh, and we played dodgeball first. And I think uh, I played the second game against the younger guys. And I got a couple of those guys out. And I don't know if it was just me and Banks at the end. And he got me. He hit me right in my chest with the ball. But hey, Paul almost got him. I, I had a double. Okay. And then the second game I but played. But it's not in, horseshoes. Almost doesn't count. Right, right, right. <laughs> so the second game I played in, right, I said, "I'm a." You know how you got to run and get the balls first? Yeah. I ran out and I grabbed two of the same balls that he grabbed. You know, like we grabbed the same. And then Pinnock hit me right away, and I got out first. I was, oh. I was the first one out. <laughs> but, bro, it was a fun weekend. I got to meet a lot of the guys. I got to be around a lot of the younger guys. Uh, Pinnock, I got a chance to talk to. Banks, I got a chance to talk to. Uh, uh, the kid from Purdue, Lacey? Tracy. Tracy, Tracy. That's my next comment. I, I, met, I met him. Awesome kid. Awesome kid. He said he wants to do some of this stuff afterwards. See how he's cut, too? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's a lot bigger than I thought. Yeah. Not a big height wise, but his legs, he got nice solid legs. And here's the thing. He looks like a running back. I know he played receiver, but he looks like a running right. back. He doesn't look like a wide receiver. Okay, but here's the thing. See him on the field. I know it's only helmets, pads, uh, you know, shells and shorts right now, but on the field, these first two days, especially today, he's playing at a different speed than everybody else. Ooh, I like to hear that. I like Jonathan, to hear that. Jonathan, I, I, I get it. You know, again, this isn't really a real game. It's not even a preseason game, so I get it. I don't want to get too excited, but he he moves with such fluidity, and and his lateral acceleration when he gets out to the flats, and then as soon as he gets the ball, he's upfield and hits that hits that second gear. That's good. I, I'm telling you, very initial impressions, very impressed. With Tracy, that's good, and that, like I said, he he's a lot bigger than I thought he would be. Uh, you know, given that he used to play wide receiver and he got tr you know traded Correct. over to play running back, he looks good. Um, he talks very well. Uh, I mean, you guys are going to have fun interviewing him. And it I goes without saying, he's got hands because he was a receiver. <clears throat> yep. So that that bodes very well for him. All of those things transfer over well. Yeah. To when you put pads on. Yeah. For sure. Um, saw a really nice high stab made by uh, Eric Gray. Today, okay, which, by the way, is important for him because yeah. this imported rookie looks like he's got some flashes. So any of the incumbents in the running backs room, they better be aware because this kid's this kid's coming to steal some snaps. To my Gray, right? Yeah, yeah, I like Gray. I, I thought he looked good from the college film that I watched two years ago. 
And then last year, he really get that much of an opportunity. Didn't have much of a chance. And yeah. then when they put him in on kick, kick returns, that didn't work out so well. Yeah, I think we kind of dropped the ball, literally, with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Other thought, uh, Mills had a defensive interception off a deflection today. Okay. Which was kind of nice, heads up by him. Uh, and and really, my only other two comments about today's workout is that there's going to be great competition in the wide receiver room. Oh, yeah, for because sure. Because the guys on the back of the depth chart, and I'm not talking about the Hyatts or the neighbors, okay? You know, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about the front guys. The guys on the back of the depth chart, they all made plays today. All of them. This wide receiver competition is going to be very, very intriguing. I'm just telling you, folks, from what I've seen in the first two OTAs, it's going to be very intriguing. Anybody? Again, now, nobody's getting hit. Yeah, of course. And that makes a difference, right? You know you're not going to get hit, so maybe it allows you to concentrate better and make these catches that look a lot prettier than they otherwise would. I'm just saying... The wide receiver room, keep an eye on it during the course of, of the summer. Anybody made uh, any spectacular plays or catches? Or I any, don't know if I'm allowed out. to go that far. Got just, you, to got say, just to say the depth chart was very impressive at wide receiver. Okay, that's good to hear. Uh, and then uh, my other thought was there was more competitiveness today. And why do I say that? Because there is no contact. Because guys were a little more vocal. Uh, body language was definitely very noticeable. And especially any time that a guy made a play, the reaction from the teammates. Yeah, yeah. Visual reaction. You know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Because you've been through these drills before. For sure. When guys are just kind of running through the drills and there's there's nothing really there. You know, they're, they're doing it. They're paying attention. They're giving effort. But then there's other times for some reason, and maybe it's because it was the second OTA, not the first, Guys seem to be a little bit more up for each other. And when a guy made a play, there were more guys like rallying around like, hey, man, touchdown. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Five guys throwing their hands yeah, yeah, up. Yeah. That's good. That creates that competitive spirit, that competitive juices that I think, you know, helps get the most out of every guy. You know, you're going against your own teammates. Yeah, but you're also, you know, trying to solidify yourself on this roster. You know, and they're, they're taking notes. They watch everything you do. As soon as you walk into this building, they're watching everything you do. Well, you know, we try to tell room, people that. From the meeting room to what you're doing in the cafeteria. There's grades on everything. On everything. And, of course, every time you are out there on the field, they're evaluating. They got the cameras on you. So everything that you put out there as a player, uh, you know, even between the video coverage, you know, when you go to the huddle, when you talk to your coaches, when you talk to your teammates, they, they watch how you talk to the training staff. You know, they watch all of that stuff. So, of course, when you're doing football stuff, everything is considered. Everything is taken, you know, to note. And it's good to see that they're moving in the right direction. That's the sound of steak searing in its juices on your new pellet grill. You heard that right. The Weber Searwood Pellet Grill can smoke low and slow at 180 degrees all the way to a high heat sear at 600. With the Weber Searwood, you can cook on the direct flame over the full grade sear zone. You'll hear the gasp of amazement from friends and family when you serve the food. Cooking with the Weber Searwood Pellet Grill just sounds delicious and tastes even better. All right, so two th those those mm. are some of the uh, generic observations I could give you from today's uh, OTA number two. A little bit of spillover from what I also saw in the first one yesterday. Uh, and we are now here to take your phone calls at 201-939-4513 on Twitter at hashtag Giants Chat. And as a reminder, you can find an archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. Jonathan, what do you say we get to the phone calls? Let's do it. All right. We're going to go to uh, line number one, and it looks like that will be Dave in Michigan. You are first on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Hey, Paul. Jonathan, Hi. how you doing? What's up, Dave? You know, I called in, Paul, one day when you weren't on, and I mentioned the smell because Jonathan may not know. You and I go back 40 years. <laughs> I said, you know, Paul has never changed. And Papa said the same thing. And, and here's what it is. You are the most earnestly enthusiastic person I have ever known. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a nice thing. Yeah. I appreciate that, Dave. 
It, I, I just wanted to. I just wanted to get that. One we out were Fordham of classmates. So, for you folks who may not understand yeah. exactly what he was saying there. All right. <laughs> um, a couple of. Uh, this is the first time I've called since the draft, actually. Um, and uh, uh, I just want to say, I am. I don't think Waller's going to be back. That's just my gut. Mm-hmm. And and I wanted to ask you about Theo Johnson. Does he remind you? Of like the Kevin Boss, Jake Ballard kind of uh, tight end. He's a more of an athlete than those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like both okay. of those guys, Boss and Ballard, but they're not as good of athlete as this guy is. You know what's really they're tall funny? though, like him. They're, That's they're both true. got tall. If I height. could interrupt you one second, Dave, it's funny because yeah. I tried to tell people that I thought that Bellinger was like Jake Ballard two point oh. Mm-hmm. Okay. And and I think that Theo Johnson is going to be much like Kevin Boss, maybe a little more athletic, mm, okay. certainly because of what we saw at Penn State. But in a similar way, I think he's a Kevin Boss type because he's a two-way tight end, has a big frame, he's long, he can block, and he can also make some plays downfield. But he's certainly more athletic than Kevin was. I don't, I don't want to take that away from Theo at all as a rookie. But it's interesting that you brought up those two names because I see these two guys kind of fitting into somewhat of the shadow of those two guys from the past. Interesting. Well, I, I love the, the, the look of this guy. I want to say something about DJ. Look, I am, <laughs> we, we will move on from DJ when there is a quarterback that the coaches have more confidence in and slash is healthier than DJ, and that's it. That's how this business works. Um, so I'm I'm a million percent behind DJ. I'm hoping for a great season, but I have a question. History shows us that guys with ACE coming back from ACL don't really hit their stride until after week ten of the following season. So. My question is, we got a quarterback who, by the way, when he's got a line in front of him and he's got people to throw to, I think this guy has a great arm for accuracy. But the thing that we love about his game is his ability to keep the defense off balance because they never know when he's going to take off. So my worry and my question to to you, to, to you guys, is game the week one? If if DJ is our quarterback, we're going to have a guy who doesn't probably have that threat or that part of his game to keep the defense off balance. Am I wrong? No, there's something there's something to that. There, you know, I, I think the the big question is, will Daniel Jones be healthy for week one? And if he is healthy, I think it's. I, I say this with pretty with like a lot of confidence, his confidence in his leg won't be 100% there. You know, it's just really hard to come back the first game and just be like, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to be the same person I was before I got hurt, and I'm just going to play ball. It, mentally, it's kind of hard to do that. Do you think we'll see him take any snaps in the preseason? I don't think so, no. I don't think so either. No. I At least I suspect that's, not, yeah. which means that's week little, one may be the first time he's on the field. Right. And, and that's that's a little the, – the, the idea that he's not going to take any snaps in preseason, i got to tell you, it's worrisome to me about how much he's going to be ready against the Vikings because, as Paul, I've said on previous fall, the offense – I like what they did with the offensive line. I don't look at – I look at these guys as competent individuals, professionals, but it's, it, but I also, you've got to look at an offensive line as a unit. And so I look at this unit as, you know, it, 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 a much upgraded from, from last year. It just has to be, but much upgraded. But these guys have got to play a quarter of each of the three, uh, uh, preseason games together to be ready for week one. That is my greatest wish for the front office and table to make that decision. I understand, Dave. I think the thing about the quarterback spot, though, is because you can have these dual team practices during training camp, and I fully expect 
that the Giants will have a reciprocal with the Detroit Lions as they did last year. You can control those kind of scrimmages, if you will, and make sure that your guy can take some snaps under somewhat game conditions with the first-team offensive line and protect him and not worry about him getting hurt because in those controlled scrimmages, controlled practices, call them whatever you will, the rules are set up between the coaches. Okay, we're not touching the quarterback. Yeah, you never touch the quarterback. So there's a safety factor there that you won't get in the preseason game. Yeah, I agree. Yep, I agree. Well, I, I'm hoping for the best. And, Paul, if that if, – if you guys come back to Detroit, you've got to let me take you to Giovanni's for dinner. Well, it would be here. Detroit is coming, <laughs> coming here, here in the preseason. Yeah. But I appreciate oh, okay. it, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Stay man. well. 201 939 List of recent, somewhat recent NFL quarterbacks who have rebounded from an ACL. Uh, Deshaun Watson, six months to recover. Ryan Tannehill, nine months to recover. Jimmy G, seven months to recover. Joe Flacco, seven months to recover. RG3, six months to recover. All of these quarterbacks were able to get back in well under a year. Yeah, but I know Robert Griffin, his, now, his wasn't fully healed back. It didn't, it didn't work out no. so well. Mm-mm. Now, I'm of the opinion that the Giants offense, if the line is improved as we think it will be, they've added some more weapons on the outside. I'd like to believe that Daniel Jones won't have to run as much as he has in the past, specifically running forward. If he wants to move around and buy more time to throw, I've said it a thousand times, I'm good with that. Show some escapability. Escapability means you're buying time to throw. Mobility is more about guys who will take off for yardage and run forward. Yeah. I would like to see Daniel cut back on some of the mobility and increase the escapability. Yeah. That's how I see it. Yeah, and, and for me with, with that, I think his feet work, his footwork in the pocket needs to improve a little bit, and I think that will help him. I think that will help him get out uh, throws in in better time so he doesn't have to rely on his athleticism and getting outside the pocket. But if you can create a little bit extra time in the pocket while staying in the pocket by maneuvering slightly uh, you know, up, slightly lateral, slightly forward, slightly angled, slightly backwards to escape the rush, keeping yourself in the pocket, which requires, I think, minimal athleticism, then if he decides to tuck the ball and run with the ball, you know, but I think that will help him feel a little bit more conf- uh, confident and comfortable being in a pocket because he has to improve his pocket presence because I don't think early on in the season he needs to be trying to rely on his legs and the Giants shouldn't be calling a lot of quarterback runs mm-hmm. if Daniel Jones is the guy week one. At least let him, like the caller had a point. He said week 10. I don't know when the week is, but I don't think week one. Look, I've been through, I've, you know, we've been through this plenty of time. I've been through a lot of injuries. That first game back, it's rough. It's rough. You know, for me playing on the defensive side of the ball, I would just rely on being physical. I would say, okay, maybe my athleticism is a little off because something is going on lower Mm body-wise. But I would make make up for it by being like, I'm just going to hit people. (laughs) You know, I'm just going to hit people. And that would kind of get me back. That would get my confidence back. What gives a a quarterback confidence? Not hitting people, right? Completing passes, Mm -hmm. right? Getting first downs. For me, stay in the pocket. Get your comfortability and your confidence back by being a pocket quarterback, delivering the ball well in the pocket, not relying on your athleticism and being, uh, um, I guess, uh, how you say, not con- like something that discredits you. Like you go out and you do something de- like defeated, right? Mm-hmm. When you go out and you do a play and, and it doesn't work out for you because your athleticism is not there. Right. I don't want them to get discouraged. Discouraged. I think that was yeah, the word I was looking for. That's a great for. word. Sure. And, and, for for me, the number one thing for I think somebody coming back, especially at that position, you need comfortability and you need confidence. You need confidence to go out and perform at a high level. I think one of the things I've talked about in the shows when you weren't on is that not only do you hope that there's the upgrade with the offensive line, but you believe that these receivers as a whole are upgraded, which means they can get open quicker mm-hmm. and give him a better chance to get rid of the ball. In addition to that, you can use more quick game also to get that ball out faster. And with Neighbors and Wondell Robinson on the field, 
You've also got the ability to do a lot of that gadgetry stuff yep. that the 49ers like to use. Yep. And, and the ability to check out of a run to a now pass to several different guys, not just one guy. Right. And you could do it to a lot of different guys. So there, there should be, with the improved parts around Jones, and then if you want to do a little bit of schematic stuff, you should be able to lessen the impact that he's going to face, the amount of times he's going to have to run and put himself in jeopardy and, and take hits. Yeah. You should be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, so. that, was, that was the whole goal for the Giants this offseason. Improve the offensive line. They did that in free agency. And improve the weapons around them. They did that via free agency and also the draft. 201-939-4513. We go to uh, Paul in New Jersey's on line three. You're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. How you doing, John? How you doing, Paul? Hi. What's going on? Quick question I got for you. So, with I know last call I kind of stole my thunder, <laughs> but uh, um, with Daniel Jones and his injuries, right, with the um, additions they made on offensive line with Jermaine and with uh, running, um, do you think that he's going to have the confidence with – in his offensive line to keep him protected from getting all, all those hits that he's had uh, last the last couple seasons? I mean, it, no, because the injuries there, you know, like it's hard to be confident coming off of something. And like when you when you coming back from, especially a lower body injury, when you coming back from that and you're out there running around and doing certain things, there's going to be something that your knee or your ankle, whatever you're dealing with in, in Daniel Jones' situation, his knee, there's going to be certain things that your knee's going to say, hey, you're not that guy right now. Yeah. You know, and yeah. you may be able to get there, but like let's say you're running, 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 and you just make a cut, and all of a sudden you're like, that didn't feel as good as it used to feel. That is not as explosive as it was before. And that right there is something tricky, that that's tricks that the, your mind plays with you and your body plays with you when you're coming back. So I think the ability for him to go out there and, like Paul said, the improved O-lineman so he doesn't have to be a runner early and he can actually make these passes, everything is tied in. What Paul was saying earlier, the ability to get open helps Daniel Jones get the ball out quicker. That also helps the offensive line so they're not protecting for more than three seconds, right? So all of these things are tied in. And the way the Giants handled this offseason is trying to give – Whatever quarterback is playing for the Giants week one, the ultimate confidence that you don't have to put the team on your back because we've improved the offensive line. We've improved the targets around you to make your job yeah. that much easier. So it's going to be okay. hard given his injury. I'm talking about Daniel Jones specifically. But mm -hmm. I think the Giants did a pretty good job in putting the things around him to make that confidence and that comfortability there for him when he comes back. I see. Okay. Um, and then with, with the offensive line again, um, their pat, their 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 run deep, their run offense has been not 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 there. So I don't know if adding John and adding Jermaine was key factors to that because I, me personally, I don't think running is a better run blocker than he is a pass blocker. I think he he's better in the in the in the passing game than he is in the in the running block. Right. I just don't. I don't see them producing good running, uh, good running games with the offensive line that we have now. So, so, what do you think? What do you think they should do? I know they've been trying to get it so where Daniel Jones is able to be uh, good in the pocket and stand, but they also have to keep the defense honest and and have a run game. But I don't think Singletary is going to be able to do that with the offensive line that we have now. Well, I, look. It, it's a like I said before about the quarterback's confidence, a combination of things. Getting uh, established runs, being able to move the ball efficiently has a lot to do with not just the players on the field and what they're doing, but also the timing of the call, what type of call, what type of defense that the, the, uh, they're going against. And a lot of times for the last, what, six years, the Giants had eight-man boxes because you had Saquon there. Now yeah. with these receivers on the outside, you know, possibly the threat – of these guys being great third down guys, a uh, uh, great get it receivers, one on one, uh, you know, beating coverage, getting getting open, like that creates, I think, the 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 ability for the Giants to face less than eight man boxes, six man boxes, seven man boxes, yeah. which will alleviate some pressure in the run game and allow Singletary, who is 
I think he's a career four point seven yards a carry yeah, guy. Well, he gets between which is eight and nine hundred. Very, yards very consistent yeah. uh, for his entire yeah. career, which means a lot. Mm-hmm. That you know, there's guys in the league who are really good running backs who average closer to four or three, a little a little less than four yards a carry. And that yeah. one yard average is huge on first and of second course. down. Well he he's been the starting <clears throat> back for a playoff team every year of his career mm-hmm. between Buffalo and Houston. He's been the lead back on a winning team. But I think to your question, and I, it, it builds off of what Jonathan said a second ago, if mm-hmm. you can show the weaponry with Robinson yeah. and Hyatt and Slayton, uh, you know, and, and neighbors, and, and now neighbors, yeah. uh, you know, hope, and hopefully, hopefully Waller, and if not Waller, maybe Theo Johnson, who's got great athleticism. The point is, right, the point is, and I'll be honest with you, Allen Robinson runs great routes. He's a possession guy at this point in his career because he doesn't have the speed. But he's got those smarts, and he's got the ability to run crisp routes. He can get open quick. He can be part of that quick game because he's got Mm -hmm. the body to wall off a corner and make a catch. The hope is that maybe you force the other team's defense to play a ton of dime. Yeah. Certainly yeah. a lot of nickel, but maybe a ton of dime. Yeah. Well, now if they're doing that, you got the that ability to order game. into a running play. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. maybe make something happen, that, make it easier that lighter on your box. line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, he was talking about the box before. I'm just simply saying, what if it's a light defense because they're playing dime? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So makes sense. This look. That's why the football, football, pro football is the greatest game in the universe. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Because it, it's it's far beyond. There's so much involved. The spider web that is pro football. It is 20 times more cerebral than chess. Yeah. Oh. Not even close. Absolutely. Not even close. Absolutely. I mean, nobody's yeah. hitting you in chess. No. <laughs> Thanks for the call, Paul. Appreciate it. You don't no have problem. to think when a big 300-pound man is running after you. You're not kidding. <laughs> the, the, the element of, uh, well, I don't know if fear is the right word, but... How about self-preservation? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> it is a big I mean, back in, in back in my day, you hear me, Pierce. Back in my day, back in 09, there was fear for uh, definitely for <laughs> wide receivers going across the middle. There was fear, and you know what? Tom Brady even said it recently. He was like, "Man, he's like these quarterbacks. They don't they don't have the fear of getting their receivers killed, and they're throwing kind of errant passes mm-hmm. over the middle, and those are throws that wouldn't happen." 10, 15 years ago because the linebackers and safeties are going to smash those guys. And it that was a legal thing back in the day. Yes. When you hit a guy helmet to helmet, they they had allowed certain things like that. You know, it wasn't illegal when I first got in the league. I know. By the time I got out, though, all of that stuff was in the trash. You couldn't do none of that stuff. 201-939-4513. We go to line two. Ron in New Jersey. You're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Hey, guys, you, you set me up nicely there. Uh, I'm not a first-time caller, Paul, but I'm certainly not a frequent caller. Okay. Jonathan, my first my first time talking to you is a, a pleasure. So if I could just set this up, and I hope I can articulate this properly, about what you just said about the complexity of the sport, I get that. I think fans are lucky to see the onion get peeled back with what media can do, and we can get, quote, inside the huddle without actually being in the huddle, right? And... I hear so much about systems and what an advantage somebody has over the si- I know this system. He doesn't know that one. He's had to work under two systems. And I mean this with respect and admiration for professional athletes. How different are there 32 different systems? Does the media overplay that? Am I underplaying that? Am I making sense? I would only say this to you, and Jonathan played for a number of different coaches and coordinators, so I'll, I'll have him quickly respond here. But I'll say this. We've all heard about the Parcells coaching tree, the Bill Walsh coaching tree. Sure. You know, so what happens is you get these outstanding coaches who have a high level of success, and sooner or later, those assistants will branch out and they'll wind up becoming coordinators, and some of them are going to wind up becoming head coaches. Look at all the, you know, all the ones that came from Coughlin and Parcells who went on to have other productive 
careers in the coaching ranks, even if it was only as a coordinator or an assistant after they left the Giants. So they're always going to take a big chunk of that stuff no, I with get them. That. So, so to I say there's 32 that. different systems, no, there's not. Because right. a lot of guys come from a coaching tree. Yeah. I, I, I want Jonathan right. to, to well, follow up here. Every, when I, I, I think, right. Paul, I think there is 32 different systems ran because they don't do it the same exact way as their predecessor right. does but, it. But those are more, sure. <clears throat> that's more tweaks. Nuance. Tweaks, yeah. But everything is like that, right? right? Like, let's say a standard gap scheme run play is power, right? Mm -hmm. There are certain ways that certain teams do it that are a little bit different than another team. But like every team runs Power. Right, and there aren't 32 ways to do it. Right, there's probably 15. Right, but could and, be. I, and I'm talking about like maybe kicking out at a different angle, kicking out a different player, pulling a different guard, facing a different front. You do different things, but like power is pretty much power. Like that's pretty much right. the same thing. Yeah, like these passing plays that everybody like. There's not too many like plays that one team runs that nobody else runs. Like maybe Kansas that, City. Andy Reed. <laughs> no, 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 seriously. Come on now. Let's be real about this. I know. Andy Reid and Kansas City, I think they're in their own little bubble about how they run things. Years ago, they used to say Mike Martz <clears throat> when he was running the Rams. But Jason Seahorn would say, hey, they give us four game films, right, to watch before we're going to play them, and nothing was the same. Mm. Every single play was different through those four games. It's like, how are you supposed to scout that guy? Yeah. So Mike Martz well, was one of impressive. those guys. Yeah. So so every now and again, you'll get some stuff that you've never seen before. But usually, and I'm talking about from a defender, watching offenses week in and week out, there's variation to everything. But everybody runs zone. Everybody runs an inside zone, a wide zone. Everybody runs power. Everybody runs maybe an inside or outside power. Like, they have similar stuff. It might be blocked a little bit differently. The language probably is a little bit different, mm -hmm. going to different systems. And depending on what defensive front they're seeing, it has to get varied. And every team, like you said, there's 32 teams, right? If they have a, the same front with 32 different, 32 different teams have the same exact front, it might be blocked maybe eight to 16 different ways, but maybe not 32 different ways. Right. But eight to 16 oh. different ways, that same front will be blocked by the different teams that run the same play. Uh, to put it in my uh, language, uh, you can have a whole bunch of different pizzas when you walk into that Italian place, right? And and one guy's got pizza. sausage, one guy's got pepperoni, yep. another guy's got extra cheese, right? But it's still pizza. Still pizza. But, but there's a little different it, topping it, it, on it. The guy who puts pineapple on it should go to jail for 10 years. <laughs> okay? I'm with you on that. Just that's one, a, that's, one a, that's a felony right question. there. That's the wildcat offense. One last quick question for this point. It isn't, uh, isn't it even better, though, to play with the same guys? Isn't that more of an advantage? Yes. If you're playing, the, if that line's staying together? That's a, yeah, that's, I think that's the ultimate measure, too. When you see okay. consistency – from offensive linemen, it's usually the same group of guys that's out there together for an, an extended period of time. You know, the Giants, the last few years, the rotation, the carousel that they had on offensive line, it's hard to get consistent play without the consistent guys being there. Correct. You start learning, you know, how to play next to the guy next to you. You know, like, there are certain things that he does very, very well, and I need to know that. And then there's certain things that he right. might struggle with, and I also need to know that as well. You know, he might – not be as good with somebody crossing his face when he's reaching to his right. If I'm going that way, I need to know that. Right. And if I don't so know that, all of a sudden that nose tackle's hit me in my ear. What just happened to you? Like there are things <laughs> I, that you I'd will learn. Play with the guys. Right. There was things like I right. played with Damon Snacks Harrison, right? Mm -hmm. Defensive tackle, three hundred and fifty five okay. pounds. He played differently than most tackles I've ever played with. But he was a dominant tackle. I had to learn how to play with this guy. By middle of the season, I knew okay. how to play with him. It took a while, but I knew how to play with him. He right, was a guy that would swallow two gaps up. Right. Right? And that means my right. gap doesn't even exist. So what do I do? I had to figure that out. You know, but then as the season went on, I'm like, oh, if he's going to take up both gaps, only thing I got to do is on that play, shoot the gap. Or on that play, wait, wait for a second. So you got to understand who you're playing okay. with, and that takes some time to gel and figure out who the guy is that. next to you. There's an osmosis and an instinctiveness between players mm -hmm. that goes beyond the X's and right. the O's of the game. Plan. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's what I thought too. I appreciate the insights there, guys, and uh, go Giants. Thank you, Thank Ron. You. Appreciate the call. 201-939-4513. Rapid fire here. We're getting a lot yeah. of calls this afternoon. I like love it. it. 
We go to RJ in Georgia. You're on line three on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Hey, what's up, Paul? Hey, what's up, John? How what's you up, RJ? Doing? All right. Thanks for the call. Yes, sir. No problem. First of all, I'd like to uh, ask John, uh, did you play with a a player at Wisconsin, Matt Shaughnessy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shag Nasty is what I called him. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, there's some connection there because Matt and my son Ronnie played high school ball football together. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in Norwich, Connecticut. So I just wanted to point that that out to you that that Matt was a a hell of a player in the one year that my son played with him. Yeah, uh, he, he was good. Is, uh, we we this, came in you, to Wisconsin the same year. He ended up having a good career in the NFL too. Played for the Raiders for a while. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, yeah, he is definitely a good kid, no problem. So I just wanted to point that out to you. And and the other thing is uh, I'm excited about the schedule. The schedule, you know, I love my 1 o'clock games, and I noticed that this year the Giants have six, nine. Six home, nine. six home 1 o'clock games on Sunday. Not bad. Not oh, bad yeah. for us. We get, home at a, we, get, we get home at a decent time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's awesome. And I love 1 o'clock games. You know, you can get up on a Sunday and – and do your little tailgating and, and get get ready for kickoff at one. So that was one of the first things that I noticed that there's, there's I didn't realize six home games, but there's nine total so far. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just want to talk about that. And lastly, I want to talk about is our wide receiving core, if we stay healthy and if everything falls into place. Those guys, all of them, run four threes, four fours. If those kids, if they can stay healthy. Because three out of the four wide receivers are, are really good route runners. If they stay healthy, the Giants can do some big things. What do you guys think? Well, I told you earlier in the program, but you know what I'm seeing out here is pretty exciting. The competition in that room looks like it's going to be very, very hot and heavy. Uh, besides your guys at the top of the depth chart, and Jonathan, you know we look at it here. Uh, Bryce Ford Wheaton was, in my opinion, going to make the 53 last year until he blew out his knee. And he's back now right. from rehab. And he is primed for Bear. He wants he wants a spot. He thinks that the injury bug really robbed him of a chance last year. And I think he's right. So this guy right. is hungry, hungry to make this team. Um, there were some other fellas besides Allen Robinson. There's Giles. There's Boyk- Boykin, the former Steeler. Uh there are guys here. Olszewski is, a, is going to make the team, I think, as a kick returner. And he was, but that doesn't mean he, he can't play some receiver. Should. Right. He was a, you know? a great addition last year for that position because that was a very position that we were like, what you is going Isaiah on? You got Isaiah McKenzie competing as well. Mm-hmm. And that guy's got some pedigree in the NFL. So I, I really believe that that room is going to be a tough cut by the time we get to the end of the camp. Yeah. I really believe that. Now, does that mean that Isaiah Hodgins would possibly be the odd man out if Wheaton makes the team? Hey, you know what? May the best guys win. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to be <laughs> honest. I'm going to be honest with you. Outside of no, I hear you. Outside of of Robinson, Hyatt. That's that's Wondell Robinson. Mm-hmm. Hyatt, right? Neighbors, and I would think Slayton. I would think right. outside of those four guys, everybody else is going to have to beat the other guys off with a stick to yep. win a spot. You agree? I agree. Yeah, for sure. I agree, too. Yep. That's a good problem to have, too. It sure is. That's a good problem to have. Well, thank you, fellas. I know it's rapid fire. I'll, I'll, I'll end with that. But you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, too. For a few minutes. All right. Hey, appreciate the phone call. Thanks for sticking with us. And call <clears> again. 201-939-4513. Coach Marvin from Delaware is on line one. Hey, Coach, you're next on BBKL. Hello. How you doing, Paul and Jonathan? We're great. How are you? What's up, Coach? I'm doing all right. Not too bad. Um, I was sitting there listening, and you guys were talking about Daniel Jones um, and the the injury, if he's going to play or not play. I mean, it's a good good sign that he's he's doing OTAs. That's a good start. Especially, it's a little different than a running back or a receiver injury. Um, With quarterbacks, I think, the way the rules are built, he can come back a lot sooner because uh, you can't hit them low, you can't hit them high. It's only a certain point you can hit them. Um, so I, I think he'll, he'll probably be back sooner than we think he will. Um, 
I, I think there's a possible. We don't know. Uh, the, I think the way the team's going to be have to be set up. They look good. The offensive line that they're trying to improve on, the receiving core, the backfield. You know that might be a little questionable. I think pretty much all of it's questionable at this point. Um, but on paper, it looks good. Um, you know what I feel about paper, but it looks good on paper. I think um, with um, neighbors, I believe that if he can produce and get open as quick as he's done in college, that might can improve the team as far as you guys were talking timing. It's mm-hmm. like uh, Jonathan was saying, you got to get the ball out in three seconds. I used to tell my guys, you got three seconds to get rid of it. If you, you don't, you, you better be looking to get field to get hit. You don't have to look for it, but you have to feel for it. And uh, I think that's where Daniel's going to have to go. He's going to le- have to learn to be more, have more pocket um, awareness. Um, he's a runner, but he's not a—he's not an escape artist type of runner. He's a straight line runner, and um, so I, I think that's going to be important. But I, I think you can put him in. It depends on how he does through the um, the um, um, training camp. I think he may can get a, get a drive in. He, he doesn't have to throw the ball just to get him in the game. He can hand the ball off. You don't really have to do much to get him in the game. But I, I think you probably, if he's able to get him in a game and let him get his feet wet a little bit. I'm not looking for him to throw it. If it's a quick check down, then you give him something like that. But you, you just get him in the game to let him get the, the feel of the game again and uh, see how he does. So um, the, that quarterback room, we, we it's going to need some work, and Dable them going to have to really work this uh, quarterback room. So I'm, I'm a little concerned about it, but – I'm behind them. I'm not going to jump ship. Um, so I am behind them. So Coach, you got you got Daniel Jones uh, being the start of week one, just health, just on health-wise? He'll be healthy, ready to go, you think so? John, it, it's very difficult because we don't know the medical. You yeah, know? So of course. For, for anybody to say, well, he's going to be six, week six. It may be week ten. Oh, it won't. It could be week three. Week. It's very difficult. It, I mean – we have to see him, and and if we see him, I think it may be a chance. Because the only reason I feel it's a slight chance is because he was just in the OTAs, yep. and again, not like a running back. It's not like a wide receiver. Those guys, their cut is very important. I mean, they stick they stick their foot in the ground and they on those knees hard. And and the quarterback is just not doing it in the same manner. Maybe when he's dropping back, he steps hard to come forward when he's ready to throw. And maybe that can affect him a little bit. Um, his footwork, I don't know. But uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say I got a slight shot that he can play week one. And and and, uh, and I think they they're gonna look and hope for that. Because of the well, coach all the, the uh the statements coming from the Giants is that they're planning on having him for the start of training camp. Now of course I expect him to be limited during training camp. But but week one, as far as I believe, they're very confident about week one. And I will tell you now, what, what he's done to this point, he, he's moving around yeah. really, really he's go, well. He's headed in the right direction. He's moving yeah. around really well. Yeah. I understand their optimism because I, right. I could see it. I could see it. Right. right. And if I'm the coach, I'm almost banking on hoping he comes back. Because I'm, it, that's my livelihood, too. Because I, got, I need my best guys on the field. I'm not saying that the other two can't do it. Uh, if I'm coaching, I work with them. I, I'm not going to abandon them. That's what I got. What can they do for me? But I always want my guy on the field, the, the number one guy. So I I feel they're going to hope that he can um, get on the field and day, day, uh, mm-hmm. week one. Um, before I hang up, I just two guys I want to give a shout out to. Uh, my tight end from high school, uh, Mark Degnall. One coach of the year in the NBA, so I want to congratulate Mark. Cool. I'm so him. He played for me in uh, <clears throat> 2002, and um, and the other one I want to congratulate. I just met his brothers, uh, Dante DiVancino. I just became friends with his brother John. <laughs> <laughs> the Knicks, you know, they 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 did as good as well as I thought they could do. They did a great job. That so, game seven was two, rough, though. <laughs> It's rough. Yeah, those two, I just want to give a shout All right, out Coach. Please. Appreciate it. Thanks, Coach. Stay well. Because you want to hear bacon and eggs on your outdoor griddle, not the scraping of rust.
Introducing the Weber Slate Rust Resistant Griddle. Stays ready, not rusty, with a carbon steel cooktop pre-seasoned and ready to cook on right out of the box. The Weber Slate heats evenly edge to edge up to 500 degrees. All you'll hear is the gasp of amazement from friends and family when you serve the food. Cooking with the Weber Slate Rust Resistant Griddle just sounds delicious and tastes even better. Uh, 201-939-4513. Our lines are open if you want to try to get in during the final 10 minutes of the program. Real quick, the other day when I was on with John, I looked up time to throw on next-gen stats for Daniel Jones. No coincidence that in 2022 when the Giants made the playoffs and Daniel Jones played winning football. Now, we know he did run for a lot of yards. But he had two-tenths of a second more time to throw on the average than he did last season. And that two-tenths of a second makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Is it any wonder where the offensive line, which was functional in 2022, allowed Jones to lead this team to the playoffs with a very, very shorthanded wide receiver room? And then last year, when the offensive line was not nearly functional, everything fell apart, even from the very beginning of the season. Is, yep. is it any wonder? Mm-mm, not at all. I mean, and that's what, that's the tricky thing about coming back for, for Daniel Jones, because Daniel Jones' successful season, not even season, the times he'd had success in the NFL, no matter when he was playing, his feet were usually involved in that game. So I, I'm thinking about early on in his career, that Tampa Bay game down in Tampa, mm-hmm. when he threw for like 200, mm-hmm. ran for a couple, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and ran for, I think, two touchdowns. Like, Daniel Jones' success is very much predicated on his legs. You know, mm-hmm. his ability to get outside the pocket, throw the ball down the field. Uh, the decisiveness, which we saw in 2022, with him able to, you know, drop back and run for the first down, he did that. Uh, I mean, every game we've seen Daniel Jones getting those first downs. And that's why I shifted earlier to me saying Daniel Jones has to develop. Hopefully he's, you know, he has developed at this point right now as a pocket quarterback because I don't think he can can rely 100% on his athleticism as he did in the past. And we'll see, man. Like, I'm I'm all for it. I, I'm a big Daniel Jones supporter. I hope he's healthy week one. And it may not look – the same week one as it will week 18 when mm-hmm. when Daniel Jones has a year underneath his belt playing with this ACL, playing with this new knee, you know, over the ACL. But he has a new knee now that doesn't have an ACL or whatever. They prepared it and prepared ACL, whatever the case is, it's a new knee now. And he has to figure out who he is with this new knee and he has to develop confidence throughout the season because that first week – your mind plays tricks on you almost. You know, when you come back from some of these injuries, your mind doesn't allow you to do certain things. Your body's not ready to do certain things. So I I don't think we're going to see the same Daniel Jones week one as he will be in week 10, week week 13, week 14, and later on in the season. I think he will improve and his confidence will improve as he gets, you know, going during the season. You know, let's not forget, I, I you know, when going through that list before, Tom Brady suffered a torn ACL too and yep. came back from it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, so it modern happens. medicine, yep. quarterbacks are able to do it and still go on and have the kind of career that they were supposed to have. The torn ACL is not a career-ending uh, uh, I don't want to say death sentence because that sounds too overly dramatic. But a torn ACL for a quarterback in these days does not automatically sidetrack you and, and, and get you uh, sent over to the boondocks. It just doesn't anymore. Everybody responds differently, though. That is true. Cause, cause but it's not an automatic. It's not automatic. I mean, they, Robert Griffin was up there. I think they rushed him back a little too yeah. early. Yeah. And he clearly tore his knee up again. There's no doubt. You know, And then, and then uh, Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz, when I played sure. against the kid, legit. Yeah. He was legit. Like he was everything that everybody said positive about him. He was, I think, was that year sixteen? I think or seventeen? One of those years. I don't even remember what year it was. He now. was legit. And then hey, I, the I liked him happened. coming out of school. Then the injury happened, and he's not that guy. He's never anymore. been the same. He's not that guy. That's so true. Some people come back. Some people, you know, Adrian Peterson tore his ACL. The next year, he won MVP. Jamal the Charles. next year. 
you know, really so, great running backs right. who was able to do it. People too, that need one. their knees and need yeah, their explosive backs. Oh my goodness! So it, it all depends, you know. And and what it's looking like now, from what we're seeing from Daniel Jones and his progression, is looking like he's more going the Adrian Peterson route in terms of being maybe even a little bit better when he comes back. Hopefully, that's what it is. You know, I, I laugh when the Jones critics come come at me and some other people and say, "Well, you know, he had Saquon Barkley in 2022." And Barkley was the guy who led them down the stretch and got them into the playoffs. Listen, no disrespect to any NFL player, but Richie James caught 57 balls as the leading receiver on that team. And he still got them into the playoffs. I'm sorry, folks. I'm sorry. Richie James was a really good guy. I really enjoyed talking to him. Always had a smile on his face. Wonderful teammate. But when Richie James is your number one receiver at the end of the season and you still got your team into the playoffs, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That says an awful lot about that quarterback. Yeah, I agree. Yep, I agree. And uh, Coach said something. I think it was Coach that just said something about, like, your best players are playing. That's not always the case. It's, it's, I think it's the best performers, the guys that are performing. And I'm going to use Kenny Galladay for an example. When Kenny Galladay got to the New York Giants, he was one of the top receivers in the NFL. I don't know what happened when he got here. He just did not perform well. The biggest mystery of my career. He, he did not is perform how well. Kenny Galladay fell off a cliff. And 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 I talked to him. I was thinking maybe he's not a good dude. You know, I, I don't know. I was would trying you, to figure it out. Would you tell these people? Uh, and then, Kenny Galladay worked very hard yo, at practice and, every week. And he's a great dude. And I ended up really hanging is. out with him and talking to him. And I mean, I feel bad for the season that he was having. Because I'm like, yo, this is a great dude. I still don't understand. How yeah, I don't that know happened. what happened. But that's that's the NFL. You never know what's gonna happen, you know. Richie James, like, he was pretty good for us that year. You know, was he the best wide receiver in the room? No, he wasn't. Did he come up clutch at times in those games? He turned out to be Third the most productive down. during that season. He, he, was, he, was, he had he was to be beaten open. The, the room was decimated. So it's not always about who is the best player. Because sometimes the best player is not performing up to his ability or there's a, a, a some type of injury maybe slowing him down. It's the people that can perform. That's the guys that are playing. And, and the, it's not hard to see that. Like, they got enough film to watch and see these guys at practice. And they put a lot of, you know, uh, a, a lot of onus on what they're doing at practice during the week. Coach Dayball said that consistently over his tenure mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to see. <laughs> they got everything recorded. Three different angles on every single play that's ran in this building. So the Giants see everything. The best players don't always play. The people that are ready and that are consistently performing, those are the guys that play. And sometimes those might not be your best players at that specific position. You can never underestimate, and I talk about headache players all the time, and we're sitting here with a defensive player who could tell you this is very real. This is not something I just made up, folks. When a defense looks at the guys across the line of scrimmage and they know that there's one or two headache players that they got to be scared of. Maybe scared's not the right word. I know you don't play scared. But guys you need to be thinking about because, uh uh-oh, that guy can do a lot of things to us. Mm -hmm. Those headache players are critical. Now, in 2022... Barkley was the only headed player on that offense, and he was a running back. Yes, he did catch a bunch of passes. That is true. But in the passing game, with all due respect, remember, Darius Slayton came on, but his whole season was not. But, but that he year. Was not, he was not the man he was the whole season. By the end of that season, Paul, Daniel Jones was the headache player. Because, and that's the point. Because if you remember, there was nobody the else. he handled the ball, in certain plays, he could pull it back. He could pull it back, and yeah. that created, as a defender myself, that creates a whole extra element with the quarterback run game. That's why, if you look at Cam Newton for everything that he did, Cam Newton was never a prolific passer, no. never no. in his entire career. You know why he won MVP? Because he passed the ball pretty good, and he ran the ball extremely well. Extremely well. Mm -hmm. And as a defender, when it gets to third down, when it gets to the red zone, and you add that extra element, you add the RPO game, which gives, like, that's a headache. A guy that can run RPOs with the ability to run the football as 
this is a threat here as give the ball. This is a threat me taking the ball and this is a threat me passing the ball. That puts us in a bind. And that doesn't happen with a non-mobile quarterback. It just doesn't happen. Daniel Jones, I think he needs to have this year, I think he needs to improve his pocket presence for sure. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the year, he needs to have those legs in full effect, full confidence to be the Daniel Jones that we know he can be. Because I've seen it before and I'm waiting to see it again. I just don't I don't think it's going to happen that early in the season. But I believe if he can improve his pocket presence and rely on him throwing the football early, by the end of the year, we're going to have a good, I think, uh, uh, developed quarterback in the pocket and then also his legs would be back underneath him by the end of the year. The way a pocket passer causes the headaches is because he's got the schematics going, he's able to hit the right guy based on the Achilles in your defense that allows his teammate to then make the big play. Right. That's how a pocket-passing quarterback becomes mm-hmm. a headache. Yep. Like you look at Peyton Manning and Tom Brady, the greatest, two exactly. of the greatest pocket quarterbacks ever. And I throw Drew Brees in there too. Two yep. guys I, uh, I played with, Peyton Manning and I played against plenty of times, they weren't a threat with their legs at all. Mm-hmm. Their ability to move around in the Neither pocket. Neither was Eli. <laughs> right. All of those guys. You throw Eli in there too. Yep. Your ability to maneuver in the pocket and create a little bit extra time, like you said, that that point ten, point two of a sec of a second. That's huge. That's it. That's huge. Like the and and when, when I got to to the Tampa Bay from New Orleans, as soon as I they was like, "You got anything for me for against Drew Brees?" I said, "Yeah, make sure he can't step up in the pocket. If you don't let him step up in the pocket because he's so short, he will struggle." You know, and it, that's hard to say. It's Drew Brees, one of the best quarterbacks ever. It. But that's something that you need to stop. Coaches call that dirtying the windshield. Hey, listen, you got to do it for these quarterbacks. That's these it. pocket quarterbacks, you got to put guys in their faces. Some guys are really good throwing from that B gap to the right, that mm-hmm. window to the right. Mm-hmm. Drew Brees, when he steps up, he's going to get that ball to somebody down the field running in full stride. Like these quarterbacks, the, the way they, the, the pocket quarterbacks, the way their success is measured, and the way they have success in the league is because they can see what that defense is in, and there are certain plays and certain uh, uh, targets that they go to to exploit that defense. And all of these guys that I'm talking about too, they were never afraid to check the ball down. Right. Never afraid to just check that ball down, get three or four, three or four yards. That's a run play. Yep. So these quarterbacks, they were able to throw the ball and get a run play even out of a play that's a passing play. Doesn't have to be a big play, just has to be the smart play. The smart play. play. And that's what these quarterbacks and these great pocket quarterbacks are do. They make the smart plays. That'll do it for this edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live. Again, we are here every single weekday from 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time Live till 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon. One hour to talk Giants football. As a reminder, the Giants Huddle podcast with all kinds of feature interviews. Hey, it's great stuff. Former players, former coaches, a whole bunch of NFL people. Uh, they are available on your favorite podcast platform or Giants.com slash podcasts. Uh, Giants season ticket memberships are available. Stay connected to the team all year long. To learn more about what you can do for the 2029 season, go to Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is still available. And Giants TV is the official connected TV streaming app. Uh, you can get it on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app and get all kinds of great stuff, video highlights and all kinds of great things about the 100th season of New York Giants football, which we cannot wait to get going when we kick it off in September. That'll do it for today's edition. For Jonathan Casillas, he is jcasillas52 mm-hmm. on Twitter. I'm Paul Dottino, Giants at WFAN. We hope you've enjoyed the program. It's Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Giants. We'll see you next time. That's the sound of steak searing in its juices on your new pellet grill. You heard that right. The Weber Searwood Pellet Grill can smoke low and slow at 180 degrees all the way to a high heat sear at 600. With the Weber Searwood, you can cook on the direct flame over the full grade sear zone. You'll hear the gasp of amazement from friends and family when you serve the food. Cooking with the Weber Searwood Pellet Grill just sounds delicious and tastes even better.
Cocoa Beach, Orlando's closest beach, is also Florida's coolest beach. Bring your surfboard. Cocoa Beach is the surf capital of the East Coast, and we have the surf shops to prove it. Plus, coffee shops, beachside bars and restaurants. Wide open beaches make way for beach volleyball, cruiser bikes, kite surfing, shell seeking, surf fishing, and more. It's legendary. Plan your getaway from the everyday by checking out legendarycocobeach.com on Florida's Space Coast.